Harry is great. And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Hey. Yes? If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on film. I mean, who isn't right now? Last week in our Twitch stream of this podcast, and this is true, we had 8.3 thousand people watching at yes. one point. It was incredible. That was how many people were watching the Twitch stream of our last episode. I mean, sure, the screen said there were only four, but yeah. that's the yeah. liberal media putting a spin on things. You know, those liberals are always so woke. Um, but if if you're a real fan of this podcast who's been with us since the beginning, yes, you can have those, Eleanor. Thank you for interrupting the podcast to ask me if you can have a blow pop without a stick. Um, if you're a real fan who's been with us since the beginning, then you'd know the two big major facts about the both of us. Uh, America's hottest podcasting couple, Bunny and May Lynn. First and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you are not doing the podcast, you are a celebrated leader in the field of science known as rabbit psychology. Now, uh, uh, tell us about this, about this, Bunny. Rabbits think a lot deeper and care a lot more than... Okay. Many people give them credit for. Uh, most people just view them as carrot chomping vermin, uh, but no, they are they are they are very they are very sensitive creatures. They are very intelligent creatures. They tend to lean toward the philosophies of Schopenhauer, mm -hmm. and this is very important to recognize. Um, but they do need a lot of help uh, trying to deal with their intelligence and their emotions uh, due to their addiction to hopping. You know, yes. like, like it, it's this is what is keeping them out of the big conferences. This is what is preventing a rabbit from ever actually winning a Nobel Prize. Uh, True. Because nobody wants you hopping around all over the fucking stage at a yeah. serious ceremony like this. So yeah. it takes a lot to try to counsel. Um, they seem to react very well to ink blot tests. Ink blot tests. Yes. Interesting. Uh, block or ink block? That is very telling in Blocks rabbit therapy. The amount hmm. of times they see butterflies. It's that's what you're really looking for. What are they seeing? Honey, thank you. That chicken sandwich is wonderful. I don't know what that yellow sauce is, but it's oh, really yummy. It. All I know is that when I ordered it, I wanted it grilled instead of breaded, but I couldn't oh. eat it because I ate the broccoli first. Gotcha. Uh, Bunny, my six year old came up with the rabbit psychology. Yeah. Um, just to let you know, I didn't write that one. Eleanor wrote that one. Okay. And not me. So just wanted to be clear. But you did a really good job with rabbit psychology. I think that's really telling about our lives. What? Rabbit psychology. Animal psychology. Yeah, that's a good point. And the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it. But I'm also a storyteller. So this is the part of the podcast where I get a story from the history books. Maybe one that people don't know that well, and reword it via my own unique storytelling panache. And that's what this is another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations, or as we like to call it, ha! oh, that is <laughs> wonderful. That is wonderful. Okay, so is this now an official thing? Yes. Okay. Ha! I mean, because you can't really call it. 
Yeah, and we've done that. Yeah, Milhap. That Milhap. sounds too much like Milhap. Milhap. I like Shap because Shap sounded like uh, uh, Hulk, and we all know that Hulk is cool. Eleanor wrote that one too. She said she she made me write down Shap sounds like Hulk, and we all know Hulk is cool. So that was another Eleanor. She helped me with the intro. Eleanor was a big help writer in writing the podcast this week. Anywho. Today, on the old shappity, uh, happity half half, I don't know how I feel about that, right? This is the segment of the podcast where it feels like a room without a roof. <laughs> this week, we'll be talking about an awesome, badass, Hollywood pioneer, a woman named Millicent Patrick. And it is a travesty, nay, a crime, that her name is not a household name. And so my hope is that by the end of this half, everyone listening will know her name. In fact, let's start now. Buddy, pop quiz. What's her name? Okay, I'm really stoned during the show. I forgot already. <laughs> Are we what? He's really stoked. He doesn't know the name. That's um, so funny because I thought that might be. Her name is Millicent Patrick. Millicent Patrick. Yeah. She is Mill a badass Millicent motherfucker. Patrick. Yeah. Millicent Patrick. She is amazing. She's a pioneer, a badass, a hashtag girl boss who should have achieved worldwide fame. But she was needlessly screwed over. By the man. And I feel very strongly about this hap. Millicent Patrick is amazing. And what they did to her, what he did to her is so effed up. So let's get to it. Millicent Patrick was born in El Paso, Tejas. You know who pronounces it? Tejas, the Mexicans. <laughs> oh, uh, what was that from? That was from. No, um, home movies, home movies. Mexico, why are you? It, it was uh, Coach McGurk. Why are you pronouncing it like that? It's Mexico. It's not Mexico. Who pronounces it Mexico? The Mexicans. So, um, El Paso, Tejas is where Millicent Patrick was born in 1915. And fun fact about El Paso. El Paso is actually Spanish for the Paso. You probably didn't know that. I am full the of fun Paso. facts like that. Yeah, the Paso. That's what El Paso is Spanish for. Yes. I am full of fun facts. She was born into intense wealth. In fact, her father was the head of construction at freaking Hearst Castle. William Randolph okay. first actual big ass castle. Millicent Patrick's dad was the head of construction at Hearst Castle. Okay, so and, so are 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 we sure that she is not the man? Oh no, 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 we have not gotten there yet. Okay. Trust me. Trust me. She was so born far, into wealth. But so far she's sounding like the man here. Oh man. You want to talk about being the man. Millicent Patrick isn't her real name. She was born Mildred Elizabeth Fulvia de Rossi, which is definitely a triple word score. Yes. Uh, what a name. Okay, Mildred Elizabeth Fulvia de Rossi. Fancy people, people with money, they can afford five names, six names, eight names yeah us poor people we usually just get three yeah and i think that that's not fair i am going to start adding i'm going to be fancy i'm going to add names to myself that's one of the best parts about being trans is that you just get to just pick a new name and it's the best and i absolutely love it so my name from now on my full name is Malin. Millicent, because of Millicent Patrick, Malin Millicent 
Midsommar, Nostromo, Boom Boom, Raid Shadow Legends, Ham Bone. Third. You need a Ham Bone in there somewhere. Ham bo- No, uh, yeah. Uh, Malin, Millicent, Midsommar, Nostromo, Boom Boom, Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> the third. That is my full name now. Not even the word hambone, the actual yes. act of hambone. Hamboning. In there. Bunny, do you want some names? Now's the chance. Uh no, because I, I, I'm easily confused. Okay, that's a good point. You that's know. a good point. Yeah. Okay. Well, the option is there. If you want to add some extra names, okay. it is okay. So Mildred Elizabeth Midsommar Raid Shadow Legends Portia de Rossi. She adopted the name Millicent because Mil Mildred uh so Millicent Patrick took the name Millicent because her dad was the head of construction at Hearst Castle and so her mom was super close friends with William Randolph Hearst's wife, Millicent. So uh-huh. she took her mom's friend's name. Anywho, Millicent Patrick, she dropped out of college in 1939 and joined a prestigious art institute in L.A. that is so prestigious that I can't pronounce it. It's... I. I Chowinard, I think. C H O W I N A R D. It sounds like Charinard, which is, I'm pretty sure, a Pokemon. Charizard. Oh, okay. But I'm assuming that, like, this is a fancy art academy, okay. so it's probably in Chomab or something like that, you know? Near it or something. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It's probably, oh, you're pronouncing it Ch- Chowinard. It's <laughs> actually. <laughs> Uh, LA. LA, yeah. Uh, anyway, she stayed at this prestigious art school for three years. And here's where it gets interesting. So she's in art school for three years. And it's in LA, near, uh, I believe, Burbank. And so in the 30s, she's in this art school. And apparently in the 30s, Walt Disney would pop in all of the time. Okay. He would get like his noob employees, the like wet behind the ears ones, the green ones, you know, the like the real newbies. And it's like, oh, you modern, you modern kids these days. I'm ass- it, it, that's not how Walt Disney sounds, but I'm assuming that, you know, he was a big man during that period in time when everyone had a cigar. Yeah. You know, I feel that like everyone in the 1930s and 40s is like, look at this doll. So, so that's my, uh, he would, uh, so Walt Disney would take his noob artists and on Friday nights take them to this art institute for classes. Here, go learn. I'm going to go price how much it would cost to freeze my head. So, a uh, Walt drops into the art institute from si- time to time, and he sees Millicent, and he's all, "Hey, there, doll face, you're pretty good at drawing for a dame." Yeah, um, because it's 1930s. Why don't you 23 skidoo your keister into my studio, and I'll give you a job? That's how every man talks. In the yes. 1930s and 40s. It was crazy because Hitler rose to power and he's all like, hey, I don't like the Jews. You know, everyone in the 1930s and 40s just talk like that. Every every man in the 1930s and 40s talk like that. Yeah, just a, it, that's just a science. That's a fact. It's science. They were all smoking cigars. Stogies. Where's my stogies? So it's 1939. And Walt just picks her up at the Art Institute and gives her a job. So she's all, oh, gee whiz, boy, howdy, I'm going to be an animator. Yowza, 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 because it's the 30s. But uh, no, women 
hardly ever did animation work. That's for the men. So Walt set up an all-female ink and paint department at his studio. And it's like, hey, chicks can't draw, but I'll let them color things. That's good enough for the little ladies. So she's just coloring things. And that's lame. Yeah. But she works hard and she works fast. And some third thing. And she's got talent and moxie, kid. It's very important in the 1930s. Yes. Hey, kid, you got moxie. You got spunk. You got some third thing. Ha cha cha. So. Uh, I completely lost my place. Okay, there you go. And so she works hard and fast. And so a year later, she gets called up and becomes one of the first female animators at Walt Disney Studio. Millicent Patrick. This is already a crazy story, and we haven't gotten to the to the part yet. Okay. We're not even close. So she's an animator now. And her presence can still be seen. She worked on a ton of the animals in Dumbo, and she created Chernabog. That's the demon from the kick-ass Night at Bald Mountain part of Fantasia. Okay. Yeah, she <sighs> created that. She, she, we haven't even gotten to the good part yet of her story. Millicent Patrick, remember her name. Bunny, what was the name? Millicent Patrick. Born Good. with the silver spoon in her mouth. Yes, and now she's an animator with the big boys that are all smoking cigars. Hey, so let's far, draw this duck without pants! So far, her life has been a walk in the park. Oh, oh just hold on. Just hold on. Because okay. she will get screwed big time. Just wait. It's insane. I'm, what I'm, happens? I'm kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> then it's 1941, <coughs> and there's an animator strike, so she leaves Disney. Gee, what to do? Well, here's the thing. Our girl, Millicent, she was a bit of a looker. She was very attractive. She was pretty. She was so pretty, she was hoity. Because, again, it's the 1930s, and it's, hey, you got nice game. Gams, doll face. I said games. That's weird. So she she starts modeling. She starts doing modeling gigs and working trade shows and some third thing and etc. And uh, she she's a beauty. Car shows and uh, she goes from trailblazing female Disney animator to successful model. And she parlays that into small acting bits in movies. She she goes to this trade show, and she sees an agent, and the agent, I want to represent you, doll. Ha-cha-cha. So now she has an agent. She's getting these small acting bits, small bits, tiny lines, a lot of work as an extra. She was in 1952's Abbott and Costello meet Captain Kidd as a bar wench. <laughs> a, a lot of uncredited <coughs> stuff, but while she would be on the set, you know, because a lot of acting is just downtime, so you're just sort of sitting there. So at, to pass the time, Millicent would sketch her fellow actors. There's a great promotional picture uh, that I found of Millicent, and it's from the 1955 film Man Without a Star, where you just see her drawing a beautiful picture of her co-star kirk douglas and it's a real awesome picture of just kirk douglas and millicent patrick that's how that's how important she is and no one knows her name and we're almost there we're almost at that part but millicent patrick yet again making a name for herself first she was a trailblazing disney animator then she was a successful model now she's the Small time actress who can uh, draw like the best of them. Her sketches catch the eye of people backstage. And so she transitions from in front of the camera to behind the scenes shiz. And now, yada, 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 she's working at Universal Studios, baby. <laughs> I meant for that to sound like Justin Mackle. Travis? 
Travis McElroy from my brother, my brother and me. But anyway, our girl Millicent Patrick is now working at Universal Studios. She's designing special effects. She's designing makeup. She's she's working directly under the legendary head of Universal's makeup department, Mr. Bud Westmore, the man cre uh, credited with working on so many of Hollywood's biggest movies. Harvey, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, freaking to kill a mockingbird. And of course, his most famous film, the 1948 comedy, Mexican Hayride! All right! Starring Abra Costello! It's not that racist! Which, I thought it was going to be a lot more racist, so, hey. <laughs> yeah. Good for you, Abra and Costello. I'm impressed with that. We're moving. We are moving around. I'm getting motion sickness from all the moving you're doing, Bunny. I don't <laughs> like change okay so mexican hayride bud westmore ruled over the universal makeup department with an iron fist meanwhile our girl millicent patrick she's doing freaking great in his department she does all the pirate makeup for the 1952 film against all flags she created the aliens from it came from outer space. Yeah. A woman came up with the designs, came up with the latex masks, came up with the makeup. That was Millicent Patrick. She's a legit legend. She was also in charge of the changing effects in Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I've never seen. I'm sure I've seen it a hundred... Well, I know for a fact I've seen it a hundred times when I was a kid. Yeah. But it, I saw... Like, I, 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 I just... I loved Abbott and Costello when I was a kid. And, like, I really can't stand them now. Yeah. It, I could do I, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein because it's fucking Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah, I can see Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein a million times a day. Yeah. No problem. But, yeah, it, they made so many movies. Mexican Haystack was freaking something, something and a half. But that's not all. In 1954, Millicent Patrick, all by herself, her, Millicent, a woman, Designed the Gill Man. The Gill Man. Nice. From the classic Universal Monster movie, The Creature from the Black Friggin' Lagoon. A woman single handedly created one of Universal's most iconic monsters of all time. Isn't that incredible, Bonnie? It is incredible, yes. It is very now, you impressive. Might be now, you might be wondering, uh, if that is the case then, why isn't Millicent Patrick a household name? What happened to her? Yeah, about that. Okay. Okay, so here is the downfall of Millie Pat, Mildred, Millicent Patrick, our hero. Universal is looking at the dailies for the creature from the Black Lagoon, and they are seeing dollar signs. They're like, in the 40s, we had all of these monster hits, but then they just sort of dissipated and we stopped doing them. But now the creature from the Black Lagoon, this, this is, this is going to be our next big thing. This is going to be a brand new Frankenstein. People are going to be loving this monster. We can make a second one, a third one, a fourth one. Maybe uh, get a young Clint Eastwood in one of these. I don't know. But we really got to capitalize on this. This monster is going to be the next big thing. And this is what Universal does to garner up publicity for the upcoming movie. They set up a nationwide tour going all across America. They send the suit 
the Gilman costume, and right beside it, Millicent Patrick, and they advertise it. Come and meet the beauty who created the beast. That is a quote. That is what they called her. They said, come meet Millicent Patrick, the beauty who created a beast, with fucking quotes. Meanwhile, back in L.A., the makeup head, Bud Westmore, who ruled with an iron fist over the entire Universal um, makeup department, he starts getting steamed, envious, jelly, because, hey, I'm the head of makeup. I am I am the head of makeup. Oh, and, and, oh, here's this woman, and she's touring all across America, and she's getting called the beauty who created a beast. She works for me. Yeah. I should be getting the credit for this. And besides, she's just a dame, a ha-cha-cha. Because, -cha. again, okay. like, it's, it's back in the day when everything was black and white. So, like, he's the boss. He's the head of makeup. And this woman, this chick, this dame, this broad, she gets all the credit. I should get all the credit. Huh. And so he makes the call. Uh, beep, bop, boop. No, it would be the uh, yeah, hey, the Millicent tour, the beauty who created the beast, fuck all that. As of right now, the tour is changed. You're calling it the beauty who lives with the beast because I do not want her to take all the credit for this movie. That's some petty shit. That is so petty that this story is free falling. <laughs> I can hear the woodpecker outside. Did you hear the woodpecker outside, honey? Was that the coffee? Yes. Oh, because we do sometimes have a woodpecker outside. We have like two. Yeah. But that was the coffee machine making that noise? I don't oh, like I don't like the new coffee machine. I don't like change. Done now, but it was bubbling. Yeah. It, it went through a clean system before she used oh. it, so we're going to have okay. to come back. Okay. Uh, are you taking Eleanor? Is this still Chap? Hap. It's, still it's Hap. Hap. Sorry. Yeah, we, Hap. We, we're, not, we're not doing Jeff anymore. Hap. Oh, nice. I get, oh, nice. Oh, I didn't Hap. notice that. Yeah, you covered up the ass. Yeah. yeah. You are doing the best at this. So, okay. So, uh, what's his name? What's the guy's name? Bud. Bud Westmore literally uh, changes the name of the tour to not give Millicent Patrick credit for creating the Gill Man. And then once she comes back, returns from her tour, he fires her. Is that bitch? Yeah. Really? And to this, and to this day, when you see the creature from the Black Lagoon. It'll say makeup and special effects, Bud Westmore, and does not give her credit, despite the fact that, again, she herself, Millicent, designed the freaking Gill Man. She did that. They fired her, and now Bud Westmore gets all the credit for it. Not only that, but Bud Westmore kept all of her work and used it even after firing her without giving her credit. Okay, so you know this island Earth? Yeah. So uh, the Metaluna mutant, that big, ugly thing, get punched. Yeah. Oh, there goes the piano lessons. Um, that was actually, the Metaluna mutant was based on an unused design that Millicent did years earlier for it came from outer space. They kept her design, used it, and didn't give her any credit. Again, Bud Westmore is created and was seen for decades as the person who created the creature from the Black Lagoon and the person who created the Metaluna Mutant 10-minute warning, and it came from outer space. How fucked up is that, Bunny? That is fucked up. That is fucked up. Millicent was blacklisted from working in a 
behind the scenes at any other studio. She was absolutely not allowed. She was blacklisted from makeup, from special effects. She went back to acting, and she died in the 90s with little fanfare. Now, uh, famous monsters of Filmland magazine and Forrest J. Ackerman himself did write an article in the 70s crediting her with creating the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. And then there was some other magazine, I think, in the 90s that gave her credit. But by and large, Bud Westmore, the man who created a monster, you know, it, he got credit for it for years. And here's Bud Westmore, and here's the outfit, because I created it, because I have a penis. Oh, fuck him. But to, to Forrest J. Ackerman's credit, yeah, he came out and wrote an article, and it's like, yeah, actually, here's the story of... Here's an eight-page article about Millicent Patrick in the 70s, so good for Fuzzy Forrest Ackerman. And uh, some other magazine wrote an article about her. But by and large, she only got credit for creating the creature from the Black Lagoon recently after an author named Mallory O'Meara wrote a book in 2019. So very recently told the lady from the Black Lagoon that told the life story of Millicent Patrick. But yeah, she was actually the first woman ever to work in makeup and special effects. She is a historic trailblazer who created some of the most iconic horror movies in the later year of the Universal Classic Monster run. She should be a worldwide well-known legend but she yeah. got screwed out of it because some dude wanted all the credit he isn't should. that fucked up that is fucked up millicent patrick she is a hollywood badass and i freaking love her and i think it's wonderful that the gill man was created not by like a, a bunch of dudes smoking cigars in a suit but a woman a woman created that and that is awesome and she got screwed over like crazy they used a bunch of her other designs in other universal movies and just gave all the credit to bud westmore freaking don't trust someone named bud that's why i've never seen air bud but that's I don't friends, trust with, friends with the hearses she couldn't have thrown a little power around? <clears throat> I well, I, I don't think William Randolph Hearst was as powerful as he was in the 30s in 1956, you know? Yeah. 1954. I don't he wasn't as powerful then. The newsies got to him. <laughs> in my dreams on my own. I'm alone, but I'm not lonely. That's from the Disney musical Newsies. Okay. I did not know I had that entire song on deck, but I do. Fun fact. So a few episodes ago, uh, we were talking about uh, Dr. Salisbury, the inventor yes. of the Salisbury yes. steak. And I said, oh, this is set during the Civil War. I will sing the song Two Brothers. From the opening of the Disney attraction, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. At the time, I was just going to sing that song. So I uh, messaged my old friend, Tom. Uh, we've been talking lately, and I said, hey, Tom, I'm going to sing this song on the podcast, and I will think of you, Sam. And then I did the podcast, and apparently I have just a rant on deck. Okay. That is just chomping at the bit to get out. And I didn't write any of the stuff down that I mentioned during that chap. Of, uh, the things that I said about Tom, completely true. But I didn't mean to say any of them. They just spilled out of me. And I, but I, it, it was very cathartic to get that out of my, of my chest, of my growing female chest. Yes. So I, uh, had you, Bunny, cut out that one part, and I posted it on my YouTube page, my adult one, and I was really proud of it. And then about a week later, Tom messaged me back. 
Oh, man, two brothers? Man, good times. That was so long ago. When are you recording the podcast? When can I hear it? And I went, uh, actually, uh, we already recorded it. I did talk a little bit about you, and it's okay if you don't want to listen to it. But also, fuck it, I'm, in my, I'm transitioning in my 40s. Here you go. Here's the video. Yeah. So I sent the entire video to Tom. Um, and uh, wow, gee, for some reason, he hasn't talked to me for like a month. Huh. I wonder why. In a month I'm now? It's, he, hasn't, he hasn't messaged me back since I sent him the video. Oh, okay. And I believe I posted that about three weeks ago. So who knows why he hasn't gotten back to me. That's a mystery. Mystery. Anyway, that is it for uh It, it must be story. something I said. Yeah, that's, pro that's probably <laughs> it. That's probably it. Uh, anyway, that is it for historical approximations this week, or as I like to call it, this is fun. It's something we can all do as a family. Historic approximations, bringing families together. Making them. Yes. Oh, that's good. Making them happy. Be sure and join us next time, next week, literally next week, because usually we do every other week, but I still say next week. But this time I actually mean next week because we're doing this podcast next Sunday as well, and then taking. Christmas and New Year's Day off. Yes. Yes. We talked about this earlier in the week. Okay. I was a bit high and I thought you might be too, but we remember. Good. Oh, so, oh, oh, well, if you want to be talking about high, Bigfoot and Wild Boy fuck you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That is none of that is copyrighted because no one wants it. So. Uh man, no one remembers that. I show that to my kids and I'm like, you're going to think this is a joke. This is a real thing. Yeah. And they assume that it was some sort of like modern day bad video on YouTube. And it's like, no, this is from the 70s. This aired on TV. I believe it had two seasons. And and it and it's been coming up a little bit lately. I'm not sure why. So like mm -hmm. I, I was not terribly surprised when you mentioned it. And it's one of those things that just causes boy. kind of a tickle in the back of my brain. You know? So I had to look it up. And as soon as I looked it up, it said Sid and Marty Croft. And I was like, yeah, Sid and Marty Croft? No yeah. fucking way. So now I had a dive a little deeper and i found i found one of the episodes on youtube and i started playing it and sure enough sid and marty croft yeah i but saw that now episode i'm too, also probably. really 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 high <laughs> that's a fucked up show to watch when you're super high and then far out space nuts comes up next yeah so now I'm watching Far Out Space Nuts. <laughs> wow, I took you to an exciting place. Yes. That's fun. So join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Historic Approximations. And cut on that. Okay, we're going to take a little halftime. <laughs>